everybody. It's me, Julianne Hartman with The Journey, and I'm so excited to be back with you today. I've got an incredible interview that I really cannot wait to talk to you about, to tell you about. I met this beautiful girl a couple of weeks ago, actually a couple of months ago now, and I just have been so excited for this interview to happen. So I want to introduce you to Elizabeth Hirschberger. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Elizabeth. Hey, man. Thank you for having me on. So um, Elizabeth, I, I met her back in, and oh my gosh, no, wait, it was, oh, it was Healing is Here. So it was in August when I met you. And um, I just, your story just has been in my, my mind and my heart. And I'm like, boy, I just cannot wait to really dig in deep and to like, like unveil some things that are happening in people's lives. They don't even realize how bad it is or how strong it is or how much bondage that they're under. So Elizabeth, so here's the deal. I know this much about you and this is all I know. And my audience loves it when I don't know anything about you so that I'm surprised. Amen. Okay. So you were Amish. Yes, ma'am. You were raised Amish. That's okay. correct. That's all I know. So you could take it from there. So now were you born into this? Uh, is your family history of Amish? Where do y'all, where are y'all from? Where do the Amish, where, where do you all congregate? And what does the life of an Amish person look like? Wow. Okay. So you're in for a treat if that's all you know. That's <laughs> all I know. Yeah. Jesus. Wow. Well, what does it look like to grow up Amish? Um, I'm honestly not sure where the Amish originate from because I'm not super uh, into genealogy and stuff like that. Um, I was born and raised in Ohio. Um, a lot of Amish live in Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, kind of in that um, area. But but we live all over the United States, too. Like there's some here in Colorado. There's some in New York. You know, we live pretty much all over the place. Um, man, what does it look like? If you can imagine as far as as far as just the natural part of living in an Amish community, let's not talk about the spiritual part for a second and just, you know, what was it like growing up on an Amish farm? Um, yes. So imagine yourself living an 1800 1800s lifestyle in 2023. So, okay. so. so you have no indoor plumbing, you have no electricity at all. You have no phones, you have no what? phone. We had no phones, not even a phone shack out by the road um no cars no bicycles um just a lot of those are the major things so the way we got around was horse and buggy um and we did all our farm work with horses and like horse drawn tools and stuff like that um now whenever we did have an emergency or anything like that we'd run to the neighbors use their cell phone or have them drive us to the doctor or something like that um now I want to say there's a lot of different sects of Amish. So every time I share my testimony, somebody will come on my Facebook or my in inbox and be like, hey, that's not true. I grew up Amish too. I know there's different levels. This is how I grew up. And so there are other um, uh, religions in the Amish that they do have cell phones. They do have like some of them. Uh, before they actually join the church, they can drive a car. Um, and then there's a certain um, uh, set of Amish that can actually have a phone and then they can hire a driver to take them to work. Or, you know, if they want to go visit family, they can hire a driver. That was not the case for us. Um, I did laundry the old school way, you know, with the old um, ringer washer where you like this or whatever. Okay, so we didn't use the. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. Washboard. We didn't actually use the washboard. We had, we had like the old school ringer washer where you had the agitator, but we had to take the electric motor out and hook a, like a Honda engine or something onto it, um, because we didn't have electricity. Um, so, so, so in in the in the natural aspect of it, I have a lot of good memories actually, because I mean. Now I watch those, you know, movies of the, we call them the olden day movies. And I'm like, you know, it kind of gives me deja vu, you know, cause that's the way I grew up and I have no problem with it. Um, so that part was interesting. 
You know, I am so thankful for hot showers and a refrigerator and and especially when it's cold here in Colorado that I can get in my car and get it nice and warm and I don't have to freeze my toes when I'm driving in a buggy. So there's still things that I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to live, you know, um, but compared to the religious bondage that we were in, the natural conveniences were nothing. Like to me, that's not, I could, I could go back and live that way before I could live with all the conveniences, but have to be under that kind of religion. Is okay. That- so, so question. All right. Cause my first response is why, what is the point of all of that? Are you, <laughs> that's, is it- that's, that seems to be the question. Every time I do an interview, like Muhammad was like, okay, stop. I have about 1 million questions. He's, he asked exactly the same question. Why? Um, I'm not sure I have an answer. I'm not sure I ever got an answer when I asked the question why. Usually the answer, the the typical answer that comes up when you ask is um, that we've done this for generations. It's the way our fathers did it or um, it's best not to ask questions. Um, that, that answer I have heard, I can't even count how many times I've asked, you know, where in the Bible does it say you can't do this? And and the answer that comes back is it's best not to question it. So, okay. So do you, did you guys read out of the same Bible that we have like a new King James or a King James, or was there another Bible? So, so that was the interesting part. We actually read the German Bible. So what? like, yeah. So we read the German Bible, like as in Germany, like what they read. But that wasn't our language. That wasn't the language we spoke. And so that was really hard because we could read the words, but we didn't know what we were reading, if that makes sense. Okay, wait. So you you were reading German? Yes. So you speak German fluently? No. No. Okay, so you were reading German, but you didn't understand what it meant. (laughs) Yes, correct. And it was so funny because I was watching an interview with uh, that Muhammad... Faridi was doing with a, a ex-Muslim, a Muslim who had found Christ. And she was saying how she would go into prayer and she would recite the prayer and she could recite the prayer, but she didn't know what she was saying. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh my goodness, that really resonated with me because that was the whole Bible. That was the Bible for us. We could read the words, um, but we didn't know what the word, I mean, there were a few words that we could kind of kind of gather what it meant you know we knew the word Jesus um but it's funny because now when I go back and I read I still have some of my German books when I read it I'm like okay it takes me a lot longer to read it than it used to um because when you don't know what something means you can read the word but if it doesn't go in you don't really remember it doesn't stick um so yeah we read the true bible like if we could have understood what we what we were reading, we would have gotten the gospel. So it was, we believed in the true and living God and we read the living word, just not in our language. Okay. So was that a family thing or was that all Amish read a German Bible? So the Amish where I come from, that's the Bible we read. I can't really speak for other, other religions in the Amish. I don't know. Did they kind of, I mean, I know they preached from that Bible, but I don't know if they had the English Bible also for us, it was the German Bible period. Like, okay, because- so how many generations back does the Amish go in your family? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know from the beginning. I don't know, honestly. I mean, I know that it went back. So my, my dad actually was, was actually from a different church in the Amish. He, he we were considered the Swartzen Trooper Amish um, because the bishop- what? Yeah, because the bishop's last name was that kind of founded this kind of Amish. His last name was Schwarzenegger. So you have the Schwarzenegger, you have the old order, you have the new order, you have the new new order, and then you have others. Oh, and then there's a lot of different church splits that happen within those, uh, all of those different settings. And then you have different laws that you have to follow within those. We were... Uh, jokingly considered Amish of the Amish. 
because you know all of so the Schwarzenegger and then the old order are a little more uh, have a little more freedom, and then the new order have a little more, and then the new new order have a little more freedom. But the Schwarzenegger were um, had many funny names, but one of them was Amish of the Amish. Okay, so what's interesting about that is you're like the you're like the OG Amish, like you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so if it got reformed and it got like whatever you want to call it like a you know an easier way of being Amish like what was the point of it then like you know what I mean like if it just if it got it easier it wasn't as strict so what was the point of that then that you could have a cell phone but you would churn your own butter I don't know that so so I would often ask because my dad had family that he he grew up actually he was born um old order and then his his family joined the Schwarzenegger Amish when he was I don't know how old he was and so we he had some cousins still in the old, old order which means you know they would get a driver and come visit us and you know um this one particular family that would come she she just had her clothes were just a little bit nicer a little more fancy and of course that caught my attention um, and I would ask her, cause I would say to her, you and I read the exact same Bible. We read the, we, we believe in the same God. And yet if I were to wear the clothes that you're wearing, it would be sin for me, but it's not sin for you. So it didn't make sense. She can ride a bike like a bicycle. I can't, you know, just all these things. And her answer again was just, it's best not to question it. Because here's the thing, when you start asking questions, you start seeking, and when you seek, your chances are you you find, and then in their eyes, you're deceived, and that's where people fall, fall away from the faith. But um, there's a scripture that they, and it's in 2 Timothy 3, I believe in verse 14. If I can find it, it says, um, thought I had my Bible turned there. Um, here we go. So it says that in verse 14, it says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. And the funny thing is they always stop there when they, when explaining why we do what we do, but you got to understand there's no, there's not even a comma where they stop. It, it actually goes on to say, uh, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you righteous, to make you wise for sal salvation through faith. And to me, it's like, if they had just read the whole verse to us and explained it. Now, it was all in German. So maybe they didn't understand the rest of it, but they sure understood the the part where we need to stay in what we have been taught. And in their eyes, we've been taught we were born Amish and in this, this church. So we have to stay in this kind of Amish. Anything outside of this would be sin. Now, leaving the Amish completely and and joining a church that is completely non-Amish and getting rebaptized. Now that is where you can't, there's no forgiveness. There's no, as long as you leave, you come back, they'll take you back. But once you're rebaptized, you're a goner to them. You are now destined for hell. So what, what would bring somebody back to the Amish? I'm going to say, can we say it's like an organization? I mean, what is it? Cause it's not a church. I mean, is um, it a, if you want to be honest about it, and I know a lot of people hate this word, and I don't think the Amish mean it to be that, but it's a cult. Mm. It is a cult because anything that you have to stay there or you're shunned for life, like my husband and I were shunned for life from them because we've left the faith. And so we have to think like them. And and it sounds more like like I've lived it. So it doesn't, it doesn't exactly feel as harsh when I say you have to think like them. You don't have to think like them in everything, but in the spiritual aspect of it, you have to abide by what the bishop decides that 
you need to do if they decide. Okay, here's an example. Here's an example. You know the pacifiers you give your babies. Yes. And some of them have a little a little ring so you can put the the clip on. Well, don't ask me why, but suddenly the bishops decide that that ring on the pacifier is worldly. So we have to, when you buy a new pacifier, you have to clip, take that little ring off and throw it away. You can keep the pacifier, but you can't have the ring on it. And and to me, that just, that made me really, really angry because I'm like, that ring is made of the same exact material as the rest of the pacifier. So those are the, those are the little things that, but no matter how much you disagree, if if I now come to church and I have decided that is baloney, I'm not going to do it. And I'll just say it was a pain in the rear end to take those off. Um. So, but if I decided that's a load of baloney and I don't want to do it, and I came to church with my baby with, you know, the whole pacifier, I would get in trouble with the bishops. Okay, so what would that punishment look like? Well, it depends. They probably would just talk to me first and try to get me to submit to the rule. And if I don't, then there would be a certain amount of time where I would be excommunicated from the church until I've decided that I'm going to submit. You know, what's so crazy about this is that God even tells us to ask him. So you're saying that this, these men, people, humans that started this, as you said, the cult, they won't answer any questions. They don't want you to ask questions, but yet God is the one that said to ask, seek and knock. That is so ridiculous. Well, and, and if you think about it, what are you going to say? If I ask, right, exactly. why, am I, why am I supposed to take this little, and, and I could name like, a hundred, maybe a thousand other things that are equally as ridiculous as that. But that gives you an idea. Like it just kept coming. Um, but if I'm going to come to the bishop and go, okay, what about this is worldly? Why do I have to take the ring off, but keep the passy? Um, what is he going to say? Like, what are you going to give for an answer? So the easy way out is going to be, it's better not to ask questions or this is the way we do things. And it's just amazing to me how much power um, the hierarchy of the church has. Like, to me, it's like how the people have no voice. I'm sorry, my light just went out for some reason. There we go. Um, and so to me, it's like, how do we, how do we, how are we even okay with it? But the thing is, we don't have a voice. And then if you're if you're from little up from baby up you're taught this is how we do it don't ask questions um and just trust the bishop that's how it's going to go and you're just going to you're just going to believe it and there was another aspect of my life that was like that that I'll get into later on um something that I was taught from little up and I believed it until I was married so it's and I think now imagine if I became a preacher in the Amish then I would continue that that kind of um, religion. And so I'm not necessarily blaming the preachers. I'm, it's just amazing to me how the enemy uses the ignorance of people and just keeps them in that darkness thinking we're doing the right thing. Right. And I mean, if you think about, though, at some point when this all started, it, it wasn't ignorance. It was somebody creating this cult. That's I don't know how it started. I think a lot of it started back when, um, you know, when everybody li was living more in simple times. Like if you think about it back in, you know, 1880s, nobody had a car, nobody had a phone. And so I think what happened, the way I kind of gathered it was some of the Amish decided to separate themselves from the rest for, I don't know for sure what the reason was, but then instead of progressing with the rest of the world, as you know, as you know, the modern conveniences came out, they chose to stay away from that. Now, why? So I don't know if the founder of this religion would have agreed with all of this stuff, but along the line, 
it's just, you know, it's almost like whenever there was peace, there was rest in the church, the bishops had nothing else to do. So we had to find something to lay the law on. And, and I don't know if that's how it was or not, but that's kind of almost how it seemed like, well, we can't have peace for too long. We need to um, I don't know. see somebody with a baby with a pacifier and say, aha, that's it. Exactly. We'll bring off the pacifier. <laughs> That is just the craziest thing ever. I mean, were there, I know you said there were so many others, but it's so interesting. Is there any yeah. other things that you know of that you can, that you remember that you can tell us about? Because again, if you've never heard this, it's it's so intriguing to hear what kind of lifestyle that they live I mean, in. Also too, why the name Amish? Did that come from someone's name or what does Amish mean? Um, actually, I think so. I think actually the name of the founder of our church, his last name was Ammon. And so I think, I think that's where the name Amish comes from. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like I said, I was, I'm not real into the history of the Amish church because it's not a, a something I care to indulge myself in. I'm, I'm, I don't really go back and see where we came from. I, maybe I should. Um, but I think that's where it kind of originated from. Um, but I don't know. I think, I don't know where Amish, Ammon, I don't know. I don't know. But that's oh, what it I sounds think. like. It was an amen, like A-M-E-N. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as like more of just the petty stuff that we, I mean, I I could think like I'm thinking a lot of the way we dress like because we had layers of clothing that we wore which in itself was a religion but then um oh my goodness like an example our aprons had little pleats in them right so and and there was a whole like pattern of how things had to be done like everything had a measurement everything had to be done just right but then when you had your pleats done just a little bit too wide, you got in trouble or your apron string was too wide, you got in trouble or, okay, so here's one, the head covering. It had to come out to here where all your hair is covered. Mm. So if I'm at church and I'm juggling kids or I'm just not noticing and it like slides back a little bit to where you can see hair and if I don't do something about it immediately, I'll get in trouble. Um, but yeah, just like our capes, like we wore capes and if it came out of, over the shoulder too far and you didn't like pull it in, that was one of them. Um, here's a good one. We, <laughs> capes kind of came together in the front. So it was open on the side, but it came together in the front like, like this. And we had a, a, a string, um, tied around our necks so we can like fold it in. So it stays in place. Well, the ladies, you know, especially the mamas, we like to have two uh, pins to hold it in place here. So it's not like opening up and revealing things we don't want revealed. Well, suddenly the preachers decide that one pin should be enough to hold it. So you have one here, up here where you're folding it in, but then we usually put one here and then one further down. And they just decided that the top one wasn't necessary. Don't ask me why. <laughs> so just a lot of things like that. It was just ridiculous. Oh, okay. So did you guys, I know you didn't have computers, so you didn't get emails with this, these updates, but it would just come from the pulpit and they would say no, like, I, they, they march right into your house. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, from now on, only one pin for the women, yeah. which oh, is because so, that so, would expose you more. So that the the original the original rule would come in our um okay I I have the word in Dutch I'm trying to basically we had a church service where all the all the rules were read off and so okay. any, any new any new rule would have been announced in that church in that church service um but then in the future if we didn't follow up um that's when they would show up at our house. And, and here's another thing that we did as Amish. We never knocked before we walked in. Okay. Oh. So they just 
all of a sudden they're just standing in your house and you're like, okay, here you are. Uh, I remember one particular uh, instance when I was pregnant and I was, oh my goodness, I think I was like seven or eight months pregnant. And traditionally, sorry, traditionally we wouldn't go to church after like for like the last six weeks of our pregnancy. Um, and I think part of the reason for that was, you know, what if you go in labor and you're there with a horse and bucky and you can't go far, uh, get out very fast. But also the clothing that we wore was, we didn't have maternity clothes, right? So in our dress, our, our the material that our clothing was made from wasn't stretchy. So your only option was, to pull your waist just above your belly, right? Which pulls the skirt. Up. Oh, right. You have, so you have um, a certain length that your dress is supposed to be. And um, I had gone to my last church service before my baby was due to be born, but they felt the need to show up at my house and I'm washing my hair in my kitchen sink. And now, Traditionally, we didn't have kitchen sinks like we do now, but I actually lived in a house that was bought from a non-Amish person. And so we we did have a counter and a, and a sink, but no running water. So I'm standing at my sink and I'm washing my hair and I'm kind of like bend over and I'm looking underneath my arm and I see the preacher standing in my kitchen. And I'm going, well, I got to finish washing my hair. So... I just continued washing my hair while they stood there and watched me. And when I was done, I wrapped my hair in a towel, turned around, and I was like, y'all better talk because I am not in the mood. Um, but they had showed up to tell me that my dress, specifically in the front, was too short. And um, I'm, I was not a very good Amish person anyway. Because I was always in trouble. I'm always pushing, pushing the the rules, and um, and I had a terrible temper. Ooh, I had a terrible temper, and I I don't even remember what I said to them. I was like, "Are right, you've got to be kidding me? Like, first off, I'm I'm ready to not come to church anymore because I'm this close to having a baby, and I'm standing there with this big belly." And I'm feeling really exposed now. They're telling me that my dress, specifically in the front, where I have to pull it up over my belly because I can't stretch it, you know, around my belly. And um, I, I don't even remember what I said, but I remember when they left, my husband was, I went and found him. He, I think he was in the basement or outside. I forget where he was, but oh, I let it rip to him. I was like, these guys are perverted. I was so angry. Um, but it just, those things, like, it it was definitely important to them, apparently. Well, and, and controlling to them. And, and, and also, we're out of time already on this show. So we're going to have to have a uh, another episode because this is so important that people yeah. are watching this and hearing the, this crazy story. And you know, when you're living it, you probably don't think it's crazy, of course. So how many things are we living with that we don't think is crazy till we get removed out of it? So the Lord literally delivers us out of things and we go, oh, wow, that was crazy. So, you know, like, what's the level of crazy for you? Okay. Yeah. But Elizabeth, this is incredible. I mean, I, I can't wait to hear part two. We might have to do a few parts because I know there's a lot here. And uh, so anyway, if you guys are intrigued by this, come back again next week and and listen to this story because it's pretty amazing. So thank you so much for joining us today. We love you all so much. And uh, this has been an amazing show and we're going to continue on. And I want to thank you all for watching and being just so consistent with your watching because I know that healing journeys are really important. People's journeys are important for you to hear. They was important for me to hear. That's why I'm doing this because that you, you that watching those healing journeys 
and Angie Womack Ministries was the thing that made me realize, oh, wait, that person dealt with the same thing that I'm dealing with. And look, they're free now. They're, they're, they're healed. They've been set free. They've been delivered from and all of that. So that's why I even do the journey is to help you get set free from whatever the bondage is in your life, whether it's sickness, religion, uh, whatever it is, disease, all of that. So thank you guys so much for watching. And if you'd like to help us, you go to healingjourneystoday.com and you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter. You can donate. You can help us bring these programs to you every single day. We do do live teaching seven days a week. And so it's awesome. God's given me this model and we're just going to follow through with it. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on the journey. Bye-bye.